It's a pleasure to be here. So Heather mainly dealt with the physical world. I will take you to the virtual world. How many of you have a, a Facebook account? Terrific. How many of you have a Twitter account? Terrific. Are we going to tweet during my talk? <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to show you in my talk is how these internet outlets, what is their implications to genetic privacy, and what, how we can harness the data sets that are out there, in fact, to advance genetic medicine and personalized medicine. So I have two parts of my talk. First, I'm going to talk about genetic privacy, and then I'm going to tell you how we can use uh, uh, this uh, social media for uh, genetic medicine. Okay, so let's talk about genetic privacy. My interest in genetic privacy goes to the days that I was an undergraduate student, and I worked as a vulnerability researcher in a computer security company. Basically, I was a white hat hacker. And our company used to give services to banks and uh, credit card companies to check the robustness of their system. And what I'm going to show you here is one of my favorite hacks. We see here, the, uh, this is the door to the IT department of a major bank in Israel. And this door is controlled by a fingerprint reader over here. But this door also has an intercom. This is a very simple device. You press on the button, it calls the secretary, and if he knows you, he would press eight and the relay will open so you can enter to the IT department. Currently, it is 10 p.m. There is no secretary in the building. What I'm going to show you that each one of you can open this door in five seconds using your own cell phone or smartphone, basically just by dialing eight from outside. Let's see how it works. Calling to the secretary. No one is there. Dialing eight. And taking the money. Okay. Don't try this at home, please. Okay. Now, the, the, the whole notion of this process, it's called penetration test. What we do, we go, we collect some empirical evidence about the status of the security system of this bank. Then we can go to the security manager with this empirical evidence and have a very honest conversation about the status of uh, his system. So what I'm going to do, this part of my talk, is going to be modeled kind of like as a penetration test, the first part. And I'm going to show you how we can hack into genomes that are deposited virtually in, um, in internet resources. And then maybe during the Q&A, we can have this kind of like honest conversation. And also, I know that other speakers have different views. So we can think together how we should move forward. OK, so about more than a decade ago, we, we started to accumulate evidence about the correlation between Y chromosome and surnames. For instance, here we have the Smith family. And if they have, they have a son, then the father will give his son his Y chromosome. And in most Western societies, also his surname. Now, if this son is getting married and also has a son, he will give him his Y chromosome and also his surname. And this process only breaks up by explicit surname conversions, non-paternity events, and a lot of mutations to the Y chromosome that will drift the haplotype away from the correlation. Recreational uh, genetic genealogy companies take advantage over this correlation, and they offer services. They will send you a swab to sample the DNA in your cheek. You will put it in an envelope with, today it costs 100 bucks. And then you will send it to them, and they will genotype short tandem repeats, STRs, on your Y chromosome, and will deposit this information together with your surname and this YSTR haplotype on an internet database, such as ysearch.org. And in fact, what I show you over here are my own test results. And the reason that people do that, these tests, is because it's a lot of fun. You can find your patrilineal relatives, the black sheep in your family, learn about your ancestry, and so on. Now, uh, well, after I did this test, I found this uh, um, a paper in the, in the Washington Post from 2006 that there are several stories about uh, individuals that were conceived by anonymous sperm donation. And also did these tests, and accidentally, after doing the test, they were able to find their families and to connect with them. And this inspired us to, to conduct a systematic study and to see if we can use these internet resources to find anonymous individuals that we have access to their whole genome sequencing data. So we decided to focus on two internet databases, 
uh, smgf.org and ysearch.org. These two databases are publicly accessible and they have more than 140,000 YSTR surname records that you can search. So what we did, we took, we, we wanted to conduct an empirical test to know what is the probability that if I have access to the Y chromosome of the males in the audience here, that I can recover correctly their surname. So what we did, we took a, a, the YSTR haplotype of US individuals that we knew their surname, then we queried these two databases, we used our surname inference algorithm to predict the most likely surname, and then after we inferred the surname, we checked to see if we, we got the right one. To accumulate enough statistics, we, we, we did this process for more than 900 individuals, and what we found was that for US Caucasian males, we can get 12% correct recoveries of surnames. Now we think 12% is not a lot, but if we have a sequencing project of hundreds of thousands of individuals or millions of individuals, then we have quite a lot of correct inferences of surnames and access to, the, uh, uh, to have a lead to find these individuals. Okay, but you know what? Maybe most of the surnames that I find are actually very common surnames, such as Smith, uh, Johnson, Jackson. There are millions of individuals in the US with such surnames, right? But in fact, we, we check to see what is the prevalence of the surnames that we identify, and most of them are quite rare. Most of them are found in one in 4,000 male individuals or less. So it means that if I start this process, we have more than 300 million individuals in the US. After I have the surname, I bring it down to 40,000 individuals or less. Okay, but you know what, 40,000 individuals, it's still a lot because we want to identify a single person. Can we do that? So we had the, the following thought experiment. According to the HIPAA privacy rule, you are allowed to uh, deposit together with the genomic data set also the age and the state of the individual. Because age and state are not considered as, as protected identifiers. So we thought, okay, what would happen if we have access to the age and the state and we recover correctly the surname? So we did a simulation using the US census data. We picked age according to the distribution of, of ages uh, of males in the US, let's say 40, state, let's say Colorado, and also a recovered surname, let's say Adams. How many people in the US would match such a profile? We conducted a simulation for 100,000 rounds to make it converge, and what we, found, what we found was that if I have age, state, and surname, in most of the cases, I will get to less than 12 males. So we start with 300 million people and we go to less than 12. Now, when you have 12 individuals, you can use other, basically everything will identify these people. Pedigree structure, we can use some of the DNA phenotyping techniques, we can use, we can even call them and, each, and ask each one of them if he participated in a genetic study. Maybe I will not call them, but someone with nice English accent can do that. <laughs> but basically it's, it's completely tractable to, to social uh, uh, engineering. Okay, what I showed you so far are basically several simulations that suggest that this method can work, but now let's put everything together. So we decided to focus on the genome of Craig Venter. We took his genome from the NCBI uh, uh, database. We used Lobster, this is a tool that we developed in a group, we published in genome research about uh, two, two and a half years ago, that allows you to recover these short tandem repeats from high throughput sequencing data. And then here for a marker on his Y chromosome, this is actual data, DYS458, we identified 17 repeats for this marker. Then we went to wiresearch.org, to the search mechanism, let me zoom in, and for each marker that we identified, we just inserted the number of repeats. And then we clicked search. And after a few seconds, this is what we found. Venter was the top match for Craig Venter. Now, this is, there are no magics here. It's internet a base study. If you want to replicate our results, please go to this link, bit.ly, find Craig, put it in your laptop or your smartphone or whatever, and click search. And you, you, it's going to redirect you to why search over here with all the markers. You click search and see that Venter is the top match. So let me summarize this slide. I just showed you how we can take whole genome sequencing data and recover a surname. Okay, but you know what? Venter, maybe there are thousands of Venter in the US. Can we really get to Craig Venter? 
So we did the following process. We know that this individual, the surname is Venter, he lives in California, was born in 1946, and he's a male. Now we went to ussearch.com. This is a public record search engine. It's amazing what you can find online these days. So we just inserted these four identifiers to ussearch.com. We clicked search. And what we found were two records, one of which our friend Craig Venter that matched to this profile. And you can see where he lives, all his former wives, other stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> so in, in fact, you can, you can even, you can, if you pay $5, you can get a, a really detailed profile about this person, but we didn't have budget for that. We just went for the free version. <laughs> okay. So I just showed you how we can get to Craig Venter, but, but you know what? It's with Craig Venter, when we started this process, we already knew that Craig Venter is Craig Venter, right? So this is kind of like it's a nice checker, but not fully convincing. The truth, like, what we really want to show that we can take anonymous whole genome sequencing data of people that we don't know and see if we can identify them. So we decided to focus on the 1,000 uh, Genome Project, on the Utah population over there. We downloaded 10 genomes from this project. We used Lobster to uh, uh, profile the YSTRs. Then we queried these two databases online, and we got certain predictions for these genomes. In eight of the 10 cases, we got certain predictions with people uh, with Utah ancestry. So this was quite encouraging, but did we get to the right individuals? So let's focus on this pedigree over here. This is a three-generation pedigree. All the people in this pedigree contributed their DNA to the Coriel uh, uh, cell repository, and we have, we recovered the surname of the paternal grandfather and the maternal grandfather. We don't give the exact details of this pedigree just to respect the privacy of this family. So I'm not going to give the exact details, but kind of like what, in, in general, what we did. So after we, we had the surnames of these two individuals, we went to Google and we, put, we did a search very similar to this one. We clicked search and then the top link was an obituary. And this obituary, when we read it, it matched exactly to the description of this pedigree in Coriel. What do I mean by that? The number of kids was exactly the same. The order, the birth order of males and females was exactly the same as in this pedigree. And it's like, think about it, like flipping a coin multiple times and being able to predict the flips. This pedigree is from people from Utah. The surname of the father in the obituary matched the, pat but the paternal grandfather. The maiden name of the mother in the obituary matched the surname of the maternal grandfather, and these two surnames were quite rare. And also we knew the ages of some of these people and we checked them and they all matched what we know. So what is the chance that we got it by just a random match? We calculated the chance, we calculated an upper bound, and this is five times 10 to the minus nine. Very, very small. Terrific, so we have one pedigree, but maybe it's just beginner's luck. So in fact, we were able to replicate that and to identify another pedigree and another pedigree. And in all cases, the probabilities of random matches were quite low. In fact, we have so much information at that point that we could see what is the relationship between the people that donated their samples to the uh, thousand genomes in the Coriel database and the people that participated in recreational genetic genealogy. For instance, here it was the uh, grandchild that gave his sample and by that identified the rest of his family. Here it was the second cousin once removed. Here it's complicated. I don't know. <laughs> and here it's the first cousin once removed. So you see, we have like, we don't need the same person to be in the database. It can be your second cousin once removed that donates his DNA to one of these fun activities. And by that, being able to, we, we can uh, identify you. So in, in, in total, we uh, breached the privacy of close to 50 uh, Utah participants in the Thousand Genomes Project. So let me summarize this part of my talk. I showed you a method how we can recover surnames from personal genomes and using other metadata to zoom in and to identify the person. The identifying information propagates via this deep genealogical ties. I don't need the same person in the database. There is no experimental work involved. You don't need PCR machines. You don't need to do any uh, uh, hard work just to use the, your computer. And the attack relies completely on public resources and basically internet access. I showed you supporting evidence from Craig Venter, from the 900 individuals that we analyzed their surname and close to 50 CU individuals. So our study was published in Science about a year ago and uh, there is very nice uh, perspective of the NIH as was published back to back with us about the 
aspects of genetic privacy and I encourage you to, to read uh, uh, their uh, perspective. So if you're interested in genetic privacy, next week we are going to have a paper in Nature Views Genetics uh, that I wrote with Arvin Narayanan. He's a brilliant hacker. He's now is a, is a professor in Princeton in computer science and works a lot about how to uh, breach privacy and, and methods to protect privacy. So in this paper that will be published uh, next week, we're going basically to map all the known studies, how you can breach genetic privacy, and all the known studies, how you can protect by technological means genetic privacy uh, and make it more secure. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the other side of having internet data and how we can use that to uh, advance personalized medicine. So some people view, we have now this wonderful technology, right, that's called Illumina sequencing. And I guess there is not a single person in this room that didn't see these slides over here. But it's, I, I just love them, so I'm going to hold them like that. And so we have the high throughput sequencing now, and the dream of some people is that at some point, each one of us and our kids, maybe even at birth, will get sequenced. And we're going to use this information to have better clinical care, better treatment, better diagnosis for different diseases that we have in our life. Now, we did tremendous work in the field in mapping Mendelian disorders and to, and to advance for advance of uh, um, carrier screening and rare genetic disease. But we still don't know how to use this information for most of the common diseases, from heart diseases to psychiatric disorders. And in fact, maybe just the, the, uh, uh, to show you the kind of like uh, uh, where we are in the field, I think this is kind of like summarizes the situation. The warning letter that the FDA sent to, to 23andMe to stop analyzing health traits, which was a very controversial move, but what it emphasizes is that we still don't know what is the genetic architecture of complex traits, how we should take data from these slides and be able to do accurate predictions for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, predispositions. So in general, there are two um, school of thoughts about the genetic architecture of complex traits. Some people think that the architecture is additive. We have many genetic variants in the genome, and each of which contributes independently to the predisposition of uh, uh, the trait. Another school of thought says, no, 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 this is completely wrong. There are many genetic variants, but they interact with each other. We have epistasis, and this interaction is what shapes the genetic predisposition uh, uh, to this complex trait. And prominent geneticists in the field took strong support of each one of these schools. Now, if the additive school, uh, and we have this debate for decades, what is the right, uh, uh, what is the model for the genetic architecture of complex traits? Now, if the additive school of thought is correct, then if I take the correlation of a quantitative trait, let's say height, lifespan, weight, then it should follow linearly with the genetic relationship. Let me show that graphically. Here is the correlation of the quantitative trait, and here is when we move from second cousin to identical twins. According to if this model is correct, we should see a linear increase in the correlation of the trait. According to the epistatic school of thought, we have something uh, uh, more complicated. We have a polynomial. And the degree of this polynomial is n, the number of interacting genes. Let me show that graphically. So if this is the correlation and we move the genetic similarity from second cousins to identical twins, we should see a rapid increase next to the identical twins. We should see a convex curve. Now, in the field, for more than, for more than 70 years, we did a lot of work in taking, uh, in analyzing twins, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, so we know quite well what is the correlations over here. But if you really want to separate between these two hypotheses, what we need to do is to move to the Wild West and find second cousins and first cousins and to see what is the correlation in their traits. So what I really want is a large number of large kinships that we can analyze. But you know what? This is very challenging, right? I can start the second cousin Boston registry, work for, apply for several NIH grants that all of them will be rejected probably, and then uh, after a lot of work, maybe I get some funding that I can start this registry, and after five years of work, I will get thousands of second cousins. It doesn't scale very well. So we decided instead to use social media for that. 
we focused on this uh, website called uh, Genie.com. In this website, genealogists can upload their family tree to, to the site, and it's also a social network. So if there is a match between the two trees, the website say, hey, maybe you want to, the two, the, to the two genealogists, maybe you want to fuse your tree together and make it a much larger tree. So what you can see over here, this is my own family tree in Genie.com. In fact, I didn't upload my tree. It was my third cousin that is really into genealogy and apparently has a lot of spare time. So he uploaded all this like, information and then he emailed me and asked me, do you want to contribute? So he didn't know that I, I just got married at that time. So I added my wife, but she was already in another tree. So we connected our tree together. And now we have this big, happy family tree. So with permission of our IRB and Genie.com, we downloaded all the public profiles from Genie.com. And we accumulated close to 44 million profiles. It took us three months just to get information, another six months just to clean it and organize it in uh, data structures that are amenable for scientific uh, processing. So can we get to these large trees? And the answer is yes. Here is a family tree with 6,000 people over here. All the, all the uh, green nodes are individuals and the red nodes are marriages. And you can see here the, the um, children, their parents, great parents, great grandparents, and I don't know how to say the rest, but you see many uh, uh, generations. We have about seven generations in this family tree. Now, this tree is in fact one of the smallest trees that we accumulated in Genie.com. Our largest tree has 13 million individuals. My student, uh, uh, Miki Gershowitz, is part of this tree and also Barack Obama. Now, Mickey is from Israel, which is what? But if you think about it, we are all connected. So if we go enough in history, we have, we have one big family tree if we all knew our ancestors. So I really wanted to draw a family tree of 13 million people for you, but apparently I don't have enough pixels on my computer screen to draw all the tree. I have only 1.3 million pixels. But here when I draw this as a compromise, 70,000 individuals, which is 0.5% of the entire data set, you can see this huge tree that we, that we have over here with many second cousins and fifth cousins, and you just name it. For scale, the first 500 nodes are in uh, um, purple. And all of these individuals are connected because they're part of this big tree. So I don't want to say that this tree is completely accurate. We, have, we did a lot of work about, we did some actually genetic testing with some of the internet resources. I don't have time to describe that. But what we found is that the inaccuracies that, our, that we see in our tree is the same inaccuracies that you see in medical studies about non paternity rate of about 2% and a very low uh, non maternity rate. So if you do genetics, you also need to know something about the environment. We processed all these profiles from the, uh, uh, the genealogical profiles to see where these individuals come from. And this is what we got. Each pixel over here is an individual in our data set. And when we do all these pictures, you see a map of the Western world. In fact, there is a very good sampling of Israel and uh, of individuals. We have also from Australia. So basically, we have a, a, what we call the Euro-colonial populations. We have very good sampling. So to, for a trait to analyze, we decided to focus on longevity. And the first reason is we focus on longevity because this is the simplest trait. For more than one million Gini profiles, we have the exact the uh, birth date of the person and the exact death date. It's very easy to parse and to extract the trait. Also, there is a lot of interest in the community about longevity. We just heard about these two companies, one by Google, Calico, and one by Craig Venter, Human Longevity Inc., that are trying to find the, the genetic basis of longevity and to use that in order to, to uh, uh, expand the lifespan of individuals. So this is a trait with a lot of interest, and there is, a, of course, a, a significant medical uh, potential in that trait. But we don't really know uh, what is the, the genetic architecture of this trait. So here is the data that we obtained from Gini.com. The average lifespan is year of death in our resource, and you can see the effect of the First World War and the Spanish flu, and the effects of the Second World War in our data set. Then we contrasted this data to a study published in Science more than a decade ago that collected a, a similar data sets using traditional epidemiological approaches. And this study, the correlation between the two is 99%. Very good. Another thing I want you to focus on this graph. See how beautiful there is increase in the lifespan as we go to the year of death? It's like very op optimistic and nice to see this, this uh, <laughs> 
trend in the data. And this is without Google and Craig Venter helping, right? Just like academics and, and medical individuals, right? Okay, so take a message from this slide. Our data set, although it was collected by an internet study, we can still replicate findings that were reported in, in the literature using traditional surveillance approaches. So now let's compare between these two hypotheses, additive versus epistasis. Okay, here is data that we have for more than 700,000 comparisons in this data set. And we have fifth cousin, third cousin, second cousin, first cousin once removed, parent-child relationships, siblings. In each class of these individuals, we have more than 30,000 data points, a lot of data. Here is the genetic similarity of these individuals. Here is the correlation in lifespan. And now we try to fit different models. We try to fit the model with n, number of interacting genes in equals one, meaning the additive architecture, two genes interacting together, and three genes interacting together. Here are the three models. Without being a mathematician or statistician, you can see a strong linear trend over here, suggesting that the additive model is the correct one. We did some very boring mathematical tests to see which is the right model. Let me just summarize the take-home message. All the tests showed that the additive model is the right model. We don't see epistasis in this data set, although we collected data for more than 700,000 individuals. Okay, so this is what the, the model suggests, but now let's try to confirm that using some extrinsic resource. Okay, this is everything is based on internet uh, 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 data. Now let's go to the epidemiological data, uh, the traditional one. Here are the three models. Here is the genetic similarity that we have in our data set, the correlation of longevity. We thought, what would happen if we add monozygotic twins from the Danish twin registry? So here are how the three models predict where, where is the correlation of, the th of these monozygotic twins should be. When we added these twins, here is what we got, and see how the additive model, based on the internet data, predicts the, the correlation for the monozygotic twins. So basically, what I show you that all the lines of evidence that we have over here strongly point that the architecture of longevity is additive. There is not, epistasis doesn't uh, pervasive in this trait and confirms what Fisher predicted a few decades ago. Okay, so we accumulated a lot of data in this study, and we, before we even publish the paper, we provide all the data with, without the names, and, and we prove it without the names, although you can f very easily you can de-identify the data just because this is the agreement with the company, but we give it for free for the community. You can go to this website, familylinks.org, Download the data, we have the, the data is in my um, SQL database. We have also a Python API to process the data. And we hope that you can use it for your own studies for other things. And already after we announced the, the uh, release of the data, more than 800 individuals around the world downloaded this data set. And this is very encouraging, the interest in the community in, in this study. So let me summarize the second part of my talk. I showed you a big data approach using social media to find the genetic architecture of complex traits. And I just showed you the work on uh, longevity, but we can, there are other phenotypes in this data set, such as fertility rates and also photos, so face morphology, that we can also analyze using this data. Additivity, what we identified in, in longevity, is good news for personalized medicine. It means that if we keep doing larger genome-wide association studies, we can really get to the genetic architecture of uh, longevity because the, the, the trait is additive. It's much easier to find additive variants than epistatic variants. It reduces the scale of the problem dramatically. And as I said, this is just the first step of how we can use social media and for genetic studies. Let me just uh, acknowledge two bright students in my group that conducted this uh, test. So we have Melissa Jimrick over here. She is a Harvard MIT HSD student for the genetic privacy, and Joanna Kaplanis over here. She is a master's student in the School of Public Health in Harvard that uh, contributed uh, to the uh, uh, social media part. And I just want to acknowledge my funding, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. thank you very much, Yanev. That was great. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions while we set up the computer for the next talk, and we'll start. Can we, let's use the microphone if we can, please. Can we bring it down? Okay, that was awesome. So you can find Waldo, I take it. I, I can find, sorry? Waldo. 
Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you, you, you explain that I am. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. So I would be very curious to know. Um, we have this uh, whale of secrecy over the reference genome, and mm -hmm. if we're very lucky, we can yeah. figure out who that person is and whether he's healthy, and yeah. put an end to this conversation of whether the reference genome is really healthy or not. We, we, I got a journalist asking me, do you, can you help me identify the reference genome so we can find this person? And I was like, I don't want to identify this. Like, the whole purpose over here is not to identify people and then go and you know, like, talk with them or something like that, just to show that it's technically possible and think about the implications. So this is something that I didn't want to, to try to do with that technique. Although I think it's possible, you have, you have some chance, it's not, you know, 12% chance we predict for use Caucasian males that we are able to identify him from the UCC genome browser data. Okay. I just thought it would take care of all the disease mappings. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess there, there is other, like, people know who is this person, right? And there is a way to contact him in a very, in, I think, a more ethical way than that. Okay. Yes, I, I have a question about the, the last part. Um, what's the impact of the environmental factors in your data set because yeah. clearly the age has been increasing a lot because of yeah. antibiotics and all this kind of stuff that is not genetic. Yeah, excellent question. So what we did, and didn't have time to show that, we, we didn't just try to regress long, the raw longevity data. In fact, for each person, we look at the time that this person was born and the geographical region. And then we built a cohort of people from the same era, from the same geographical region, and we saw what is the mean value of this cohort versus this person. So we sub subtracted the mean, and this is what we regress in. This is how we defined longevity, the excess or, or the depletion of the lifespan of this person. And basically, so just fixed effect, uh, we regress out the fixed effects before doing that. Longevity. Uh, this, this, by the way, this, uh, well, the well, model well. is outstanding, and then it really uh, reflects Cochrane's um, and also Bill Hill's okay. um, work on that additivity rules and epistasis is not um, present. But on the other hand, let's go back to Fisher and Wright's um, work, 1930s, and all the, the fight between them about um, additivity versus um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, dominance, dominance effects. Mm -hmm. So what is the role of dominance here? One, that's my first question. And second, when we go to longevity, longevity is a comp it is not only complex trait, but it's also a composite trait. Mm -hmm. Longevity is related to other traits that precedes these, and also there is, um, there, there is also um, the developmental um, uh, variation in longevity. Mm -hmm. So when you when you look at all of the all of those things, and the 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 answer that you are giving is uh, glosses over some of these complexities, and then so uh, to say um, additivity uh, com uh, additivity rules is partly correct, but, but on the other hand, to um, evade that Sewell Wright was wrong is also partly incorrect. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Go ahead, Janet. Yeah. Yeah. So I will answer the, the second part first. I don't, we don't say that epistasis is absent for every trait. We just analyze longevity, and for longevity, this is what we have. We don't see epistasis, although we analyze tons of data, and we use different models, and we also use this extrinsic validation. We just don't see that in longevity. I don't know about other traits. It might be plausible that longevity plays some role, but we need data uh, uh, to address this uh, question. Uh, the first part, remind me, was about, um, the first part was about Fisher and Wright and the implications of epistasis, I believe. So, so another thing I want to emphasize, many of you, you go, you go to your lab, you do experiments with animals, and you s we report physical epistasis. We know that proteins interact with each other. There is a difference between physical epistasis and the genetic epistasis. Physical epistasis is just about two genes interacting together. I agree, this exists, and there is a lot of data about that. Genetic epistasis means now put on top of the physical epistasis, epistasis the frequency of the variants in the population. Think about if our causal variants are quite rare, the probability that two causal variants will be the same, in the same person is extremely, extremely rare. So it should not affect so much the architecture of the trait in the population. 
So there is a difference I want to emphasize between physical epistasis and the statistical epistasis that we see in, in, in this data set. Okay, very quick question, how, quick answer, and then uh, we'll go uh, how, how many, no, how I'm many? Sorry, I'm sorry, we've got to move on here. We've got, okay, we, uh, sorry, take that uh, uh, after the session. Final question here in the, in the hall. Um, so I think partially based on your work, there's been recent guidance with HIPAA saying that basically genomic information is publicly identifiable. Um, so at least where I work for, we've decided we have to meet all the HIPAA requirements, PHI requirements, even though like one year ago, we probably wouldn't have considered this private health information. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, like, I hear a lot of things about sharing genomic data, et cetera. Do you think that's still going to be possible? I hope that it's going to be possible because if we want to advance genetic medicine, we need to share information. The take home message from our study is not stop sharing data, is that go to your participants, be very transparent about the risks, about the possibility to identify them. It doesn't mean that there is a risk for you know, something harmful, but about the possibility to identify them, but also explain them about the wonderful benefits of genetic information for, for the community, for, for patients, and let them decide after being informed how they want to proceed. And I really hope that people will keep contributing their genetic information for, for medical studies, because this is the only way that we can move forward to develop our science medicine. So your hope is that basically the agreements people sign will accept they can be identified. And so, so it can be based on, on consent. It can be based on developing better legislation, expanding GINA, for instance, that will people feel more comfortable. And also there are some technical means that some groups are starting to develop to protect the information. And we review these technical means in the paper. And, and you can see, I don't have time to go over that. But there are some methods in some scenarios that it can protect your data. OK, let's leave it there for now. Yanni, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>